Welcome to Kidney Health Interview Podcast, brought to you by RenalMate and the Renal Patient Support Group, RPSG. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalia. I'm with RenalMate. On today's podcast, I have a very special guest, Ademomi Olayton. And she's from UK, and she's speaking with us uh, on a, a very interesting topic about uh, awareness of ESRD and also awareness of the blood and organ donation in Asian and Black community. So I'm excited to have uh, for an hour podcast. Uh, hello, how are you doing? Hello, I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank uh, you. I'm so grateful today we will be talking about your own story and your own journey in sharing awareness and creating campaigns that helping other patients. Um, so let's start from uh, introduction to what you do, where you're based, uh, and then we'll proceed with uh, conversation where your journey begins with kidney disease. Yeah, so as she said, you've, my name, full name is Adebomi Olaiton. I live in Bristol, United King, England, United Kingdom. And um, yeah, and I've had renal failure since I was nine. And that's, um, I've had two transplants and I've been on dialysis from 2004 to present. And um, whilst I was stylizing and talking to people, you know, talking to people who don't have it, uh, and I was amazed by the questions I was getting by people who didn't have renal failure. Um, like for instance, they didn't realize you have to dialyze three times a week, four hours or more, depending on your, but you know, whether you need more. Um, and also they didn't realize you have to do it every week. They thought you do it once a weekend, you know, you don't do less hours the next week and you know, so and so. So it's just, yeah, I've just been amazed. So that's how I started and I just wanted to, I liked my own, and I've, um, I've done an event, and I realized personal stories is a good way of sharing knowledge, and I, that's what I've been doing, sharing, my, sharing knowledge to people by, by my own experience, you know, of renal, renal failure, yeah, so, yeah, that's what I've been doing, really, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear in your voice, it's um, certainly a lot of frustration, right, when um, from the diagnosis and living with ESRD, explaining to every person who asking, oh, what is your health condition? What is dialysis? And kind of going into the basics that seems to be so obvious, but um, this knowledge is not available to general public. Mm. No, no, it's not. It's just like, um, another example was, um, there was a lady in my children um, where I was stylizing, and she said to me one day, she didn't realize, how much you needed your kidneys until she started doing, you know, dialysis. She didn't realize what they did. So, oh, oh did they do a lot of work, these kidneys? You didn't, you, you didn't, re- then all of a sudden it registered that actually you do, those are one of the vital organs you need, you know, because it does so much work. But yeah, it's just good to, it's just interesting to see yeah, it's just interesting to see people's, um, how people think about the disease, what they know. Um, and sometimes I still get people think they know more than me. And I've been dialyzing, you know, I've been a renal um, patient since I was nine. And that can be annoying. <laughs> They're telling me what I should be doing. I say, no, I should be telling you what I do. <laughs> yeah, it's just like really strange. Yeah, so you get a lot of that, but yeah, it's just, um, it's just amazing. And I stand there sometimes and thinking, oh dear, am I actually, is this really happening to me? You know, it's, yeah, it's weird. It's yeah, really- uh, at the moment, thank you so much for sharing that experience because I'm sure many uh, patients who are listening to us, they have same frustration and it's very emotional. And on one side, you have a daily battle, you're fighting with the disease that, uh, hard to manage it requires a lot of daily management um, yeah, it does. a lot of symptoms but it's a hidden disease so for many people they were not aware that you ill because it's not, not that pronounced yeah. right you don't look necessarily yeah. ill 
Um, so let's start from the beginning. You know, yeah. let's uh, share your story. Uh, so you mentioned you went under a renal failure at the age of nine. Yeah. Uh, did you have CKD uh, previously? How did you get diagnosed? What was your journey as a child? Um, as a child, well, I, I was diagnosed when I was nine in July 1984, and I didn't have any symptoms. All I did um, is I was rushed to hospital, and the doctors done all the blood tests, and they told my dad, oh, sorry, but your child's got renal failure. And he said, are you sure? And he, he wanted, um, he got a second um, opinion. And the second opinion was still the same. Your child has got renal failure. And he was saying, that can't be right. You know, why is renal failure? And I haven't, you know, I haven't heard of it. Nobody in the family's got it. And so no, is that, yeah, the, these blood tests say renal failure. And he didn't understand um, why there wasn't any um, symptoms. Because everything seems okay, you know, running about, you know, no, no symptoms whatsoever. Um, yeah, so I was taken there and I had an operation and I was still, and from after the operation I had to go straight onto dialysis. It was so bad. Yeah, the levels was really high. Everything was just out of the range. So I don't, yeah, but it was, yeah, it was quite frightening for me as a child because I never heard of renal failure, kidney failure, renal failure. What's that? And yeah, it wasn't as, as a child, it wasn't as stressful as for the family because I got sisters as my dad and my sisters. So it was more stressful for them when I was younger. But now, as an adult, it seems more stressful for me to take a stand. <laughs> so yeah, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. And then we, um, they told me, they told my dad what I needed to eat, you know, low salt, no salt. Um, yeah, just watch for your potassium phosphate. So my dad would cook me meals with no salt. And I tasted it. <laughs> I tasted my meals. And it was all, it didn't taste very nice. <laughs> so it didn't have any flavor. But I needed to just reduce the amount of potassium, sodium, everything you can think of that, you know, the kidney needs to get rid of. So yeah, it was very, uh, yeah, it was very, yeah, it was very frightening, and um, because I was at it such a young age, it not only felt scary, but I don't know what to say, it just felt scary, and I felt alone, because I missed quite a lot of school, and back in those days, there wasn't schools in the hospital, so yeah, my social skills weren't at the right level, I missed a lot of school and things I should have known at an age I didn't know. So, yeah, it affected my schooling. At the age of nine, you've been rushed to dialysis. And which modality of dialysis have they prescribed to you? Which, which type? Which type, right. Yeah, yeah. it was um, hemodialysis, yeah. Hemodialysis. Yeah. Uh, so with hemodialysis at age of nine, you would need to go to clinic three or four times a week for yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry, it was CAPD first, sorry, then mm -hmm. dialysis. Um, I had CAPD for a long time. I think, yeah, I had CAPD overnight, and then I, the nurse would wake me up, then distract, um, the, but they, I think the CAPD wasn't really working, then they switched me to H, um, hemodialysis. So, yeah, and that worked a bit better for me. And how was it, like, being eight, nine or 10 years old when you were admitted to hemodialysis, going to dialysis unit. How was your experience, remember, like going uh, to the clinic and staying yeah. there for the treatment? Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, I got on with, because was only, I remember the unit called Bostock unit. I don't know why I remember the unit's name. Out of what, anything you should be remembering, I remember the unit. And I remember the ward was Dickinson's ward. So in Guy's Hospital, in, you know, in London, England, United Kingdom. Yeah, so um, I used to do it three times a week. A week. Um, the nurse used to take me there and then the, I'll be um, taken back to the ward. Whilst I was there, I met different people around my age because it was only a small unit. I think it was only about six of us on there. So, yeah. It was quite cosy, it's quite yeah, small unit. And it's funny because the machine we used to use there and now is so different. Because if you were to use, see the machine I was using back in the days and the machine now, you see, you think it was from another planet. It was
was so different. <laughs> it was really bulky, and whilst these ones are a bit less bulky, they're a bit less bulky, but yeah, it's so funny when you when I look back on it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, kind of... that's really fascinating, right? Like when you're a child, uh, how your memories and perception of things form, um, especially being in that clinic environment for so long yeah. in hospitals. Yeah. So you mentioned that treatment and school balance was not necessary there. And it was quite challenging for you as a, a young teenager, then going through school and managing your dialysis or being out of um, a school for your surgery. Um, so how did you overcome this? Was there were any point that things got a little bit better or uh, things were quite challenging for entire uh -huh. time in the school? Um, when I, because I was diagnosed with renal failure when I was nine, uh, July 1984, by the September I had a transplant, so everything seemed to go back to normal. But that, um, that transplant lasted until, um, I think, about April, to, April 1987, and in May I had my tran another transplant, which, yeah, which much, was a bit more uh, longer. For me to catch up but yeah it was yeah so um yeah i just uh, yeah i just remember feeling because when i did start school i just remember feeling not able to fit in yeah why so why so did it just miss just, time or yeah, just frustration it's just, it, it's just the social skills i just realized i just wasn't fitting in um yeah, I just didn't, I didn't feel I fitted in, in terms of able to make friends. Um, I'm, you know, back in those, you know, children are like, they want to be liked. Um, yeah, just unable to meet pe people that are, you meet somebody, you can meet somebody, even as a child, you can meet somebody, another child once, and do you like them? and didn't get that at all yeah just nothing i just felt empty it's just i felt empty yeah very sorry to hear that i'm sure it yeah, was, felt empty it was difficult right just dealing with your struggle as a disease but then overcoming like the social environments and yeah, yeah. not finding necessary that it, you know support uh, mm. is hard uh, but then finding friends it certainly helps right to manage um, those barriers in social mm. life and yeah. uh, uh, so when um, I'm just trying to get the chronological order to understand your story better. Uh, so you've been rushed to dialysis and then within a few years you received transplant. At what age did you receive your first transplant? Oh, uh, yeah, I received it when, yeah, I received it when I was nine. Because I was diagnosed in the July, in September, <laughs> I had it, the first transplant. Ah, okay. So that's how so you started the You yeah. got that trans. Uh, you went to the dialysis, but then you were able to receive transplant. Yeah. And it lasts you a number of years. And yeah. what happened after? Uh, did it fail? What was? Yeah, happening? yeah, it failed. It failed. Yeah. But the but second time lucky from May 1987 to 2004, I had a good running with the second kidney. So yeah. Uh, so tell me more about your organ donors. How did you receive, uh, you know, your first and second kidney and who were the organ donors? Yeah, the first one was a deceased one. Um, I don't remember. The, the only one I remember was the second one. It was, she was deceased. I think she was 30 and she, um, she had epilepsy fit or something. Yeah, which she, I don't know which she didn't recover from. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, but otherwise she was in good condition in terms of organ. She was in good condition. Yeah, yeah. It's such a big difference receiving kidney from uh, uh, patients who are healthier, younger, uh, because a kidney can last years mm -hmm. and years, like mm -hmm. up to thirty years. Um, and uh, with that, uh, how many uh, kidney transplants have you received so far through your life? Um, I am um, two. I've received two. The next one would be my last because I am, I'm only 4'11". So uh, um, the doctor said they kind of ran out of place to put 
the fourth kidney. If I, yeah, there's no fourth kidney. It's just another third, last kidney, which will be my third. Yeah, I'm only, yeah, I'm only four eleven. You know, I'm very short, very very short. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. Uh, so what's the process in general when you um, looking for your organ, um, you know, for kidney donation? Uh, how do you go about it? Was it something that just a uh, hospital find you the organ donor, or did you need to do a campaign? Uh, oh, uh, oh, um, the, the, yeah, in, a, in the um, in United Kingdom, the NHS, they look for it and match you up. So, yeah, um, and but they were saying with me that, um, I what I have been called for two trans, you know, kidney offers, but when I they explained it, I said, Oh, it's all right, I don't need those ones because I didn't feel one of them was too old, which I thought because I'm only 43, the person was 60. The second one, they were saying they needed to check for malaria, and I said, Oh, no. I don't want that one. And what they did tell me, my consultant has told me, since because of the previous transplant, you know, you build up antibodies, so the match on the deceased register is not gonna be as it's not gonna be that good. Yeah. Yeah, there are you know just statistics of so receiving kidney for live donor versus deceased don donor. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, going through such a complicated surgery and putting so much uh, trauma in you know, terms of like emotional and physical going through organ transplantation is hard so no wonder you're always looking what will be the best choice and if yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and also um if one one previous um one of the patients who i used to dialyze with he he decided to take a damaged kidney and he died oh, yeah sorry to yeah. hear that um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's you know, it, yeah, and uh, for example, in the United States, um, we're based in California, and we have a long waiting list. It's oh, around yeah. eight years, and for some people, even 10 years before they uh, get the kidney, even if they qualified. Uh, so tell me, what's the situation in Bristol and UK in general? How long the wait list? Uh, kidney. The, yeah, it depends because the um, Africans and Caribbeans and Asians wait longer because there's not many people registering to donate their kidneys from those backgrounds. The Caucasians, the white people, they tend to get one quicker because there's more of them registering. Yeah, registered on the all. Yeah, the new, yeah. Um, and, so sharing yeah. with the ethnicity background, uh, tell me more about. Uh, uh, do, does a kidney, let's say, from Asian uh, a donor wouldn't be the right match for the Caucasian or uh, from Caucasian to, uh, uh, you know, African ethnicity? Does this, does this matter? Is it matter? Uh, yeah, because what you want to do, you want to, what they like to do in the NHS, they like to, if you're Caucasian white, they want to give it to another Caucasian. And if you um, and it, the, it's better it, because there's been the NHS has said, has said is better match and they seem to work much better when it comes from your ethnicity. You can, you know, I can have it from a white, you know, Caucasian person or Asian, but it's better to match everybody up with their own race. It's just, yeah, it's just like things like um, um, bone marrow transplant. He has to come for so if I if one somebody I know um at a bone marrow transplant she's Caribbean and her sister donated, he had to come from a black person. He can't come from a Caucasian Asian. It's, it works better. And that's one of those I think with the bone marrow transplant, the, you need to definitely get it from your own race. With the kidney transplant, it can still work well. You know, you can still work well, but they, the NHS really like it from to get, match it up with your own race. Yeah, yeah. yeah that does. would be interesting, right? To talk with a scientist, maybe with uh, Shahid Muhammad, we can talk about this topic. Um, I'm just really curious because uh, uh, certainly, you know, when the wait list is so long and seeing, you know, what's available and some ethnicity have to wait way longer. Um, and I'm really not aware what the situation for 
you know, different ethnicity. So tell me, yeah. what's the situation for uh, people of your ethnicity, Asian ethnicity, since you are the advocate for organ and blood donation for Asian and black ethnicity? Um, well, we wait the longest. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, we wait the longest. Yeah, we just wait the longest and with the Caucasians, um, the Caucasians, what they tend to do is, um, since more of them are on the waiting list, you know, they said, oh yeah, when I pass away, I like to donate my organs. They get it quicker than, yeah, that is really what it's about. So it basically is, it all depends on the number of people who have put themselves forward on the wait on the, um, organ donation to donate so obviously if you have more black people african people asian then it's likely some patients are black patients asian patients will receive an organ quicker so that's what it's really all about yeah uh, so i'm just curious in terms of population in uk same mm. as the united states so when we're looking for different ethnicities uh, just by the numbers, you know, Caucasian would be higher in a percentage that, yes. uh, you know, people from Asia, people from Latin America, people from Africa. So how yeah. does it work? Uh, is it still just very much dependent from, right, just having that ethnicity? And uh, if the population only three or four percent of the entire country population, so certainly you have a very smaller amount to expect to donate timely yeah i mean in um because i live in bristol it's got a small amount of um african C C asian and caribbean but in london it's got a higher percentage and then you've got bradford which is up north that is predominantly asians and in Birmingham, which is up north in England, that's predominantly Asians. So if you were to think about it, if you were to think that all the black people in London were registered on the, you know, organ donation list, and, and yeah, places with the high per percentage of um, black, you know, black Asians and Africans, if you were to, Caribbean Asians and Africans, if you were to think London is gone and all those people in those city, you can never know, it might even make a big difference. The small amount of people in those city might, it does, it does definitely make a difference. And also, um, you need to, people need to remember is with transplant, especially with kidney, um, I don't know about any other organ, um, you can have more than one kidney transplant, you see? So if you imagine you've got all these people waiting and one person is going to get a free transplant like me, then there's a whole heap of kidneys you need to serve the, do you understand? Because another patient, he's going to be able to have four. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of kidneys you'll need really when you think about it. It's not like you have one kidney. They give you one kidney. You can have one kidney and that can last about 40 years, isn't it? And then you can get another one and that can last you, yeah. But um, if you're thinking the average one, I think people tend to get three or four kidneys, just one person. So maybe that's why um, in terms of the Africa being, we need, you know, when you put it all together, everybody needs quite a few transplants. Really yeah, I really like how you put it together in terms of, uh, you know, big picture. Because yeah. if you're looking for patients who went through renal failure early in their life, uh, that requires number of kidneys, say, in their life. Exactly, right? exactly. And it has to be planned out well. Yeah, exactly. Because I, um, I started renal failure when I was nine. Somebody I know started when it, um, there were six months. You see, so that's a lot of kidney just for one person. And you see, and I think the problem is the numbers. You, as I said, one person needs so many kidneys, but there's not enough to go around, is it? I don't think, yeah, and that's the problem. There's not enough to go around. Mm -hmm. So there yeah. are a number of problems, right? And a um, few of them would be certainly awareness about uh, organ donation in general. And population of the country, 
325 million. So that is a small percentage. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, a little more than half a percent of people who went on the renal failure in a country. And when we see in the organ donation that uh, if more people sign up for organ donation or everyone would sign for organ donation, there are very higher chances uh, to provide and satisfy those needs of uh, you know, kidney um, donation for individuals who need them or actually multiple kidney in a lifetime. Yeah, multiple, yeah, multiple kidney. I, um, I, huh, because I, I read somewhere that I know understand what you're saying because, because I'm just doing it as a unit because, uh, you know, when I go to dialysis, I see more and more people. I'm just basing it in Bristol not in London, not in the UK, mm -hmm. just in Bristol. I see more and more, and I feel it's getting more. Oh, yeah, I don't know what population, it's probably, I don't know how many people in the United Kingdom, in England, where I live, a few million, but it's getting a, um, a bit more, and I'm not sure whether, I don't know, I don't know whether, if, if he, as I said, I like to think if everybody registered, they could meet the needs. Because I was, when I did the research as um, the NHS, it said one person, one deceased person can save nine lives. So you're talking about two kidneys, you get one liver, two lungs, isn't it? One heart and eyes, yeah. So you can take, um, one person can save nine lives, which is amazing. Right, so, nine lives. And, it's good, yeah. and each of these people have families and friends, right? So it's ultimately those um, simple donating for you know just signing up as a list of donors as a deceased donor it's already a huge step if someone not ready to do the live donation yeah. and um, uh, so uh, doing advocacy for so many years and uh, uh, you know being a grateful ESRD patient who went through all these experiences and faced the hard hardship of waiting for kidney uh, and you know receiving kidney how do you see the system could improve for also live donation? How to share that the live donation could be more acceptable or is there is some reforms have to change healthcare support? What things I might be missing you believe that yeah. could be improved? I don't know because in England, the NHS, you know, National Health, yeah, you know, um, our um, health system, they try to, they do a good job in encouraging that. But the problem with life donation is very difficult in terms of, it is easier for um, pay mom, dad to donate to the son or daughter, you see? That's mm -hmm. the most simplest one, mm -hmm. yeah. But when you get to the siblings, like brothers and sister, that's when it gets complicated. It's a, it's a bit more um, difficult because I don't think a lot of brothers and sisters want to do, you know, if you, yeah, do that. They're happy to do it for their own child, but not for, not for like a sister or brother. That's where the complication is. Also, another thing is scared, if, uh, another thing is, scary is if the person if the if somebody like for example if the parents donate to the son or daughter and the son or the mom or dad end up with the renal failure the parents might feel that's accept you know oh i've done it for my child do you see but if this brother or sister and um, you know brothers donate to his sister and then the brother end up with renal failure he might not be very happy you see, so is it, it just, and that's what I'm realizing. It's yeah, with yeah, with parents who don't blink an eyelid, they love their child to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. And um, or yeah, so and also um, the NH because I know is it issue. I think I was looking reading in an article that issue. They got this. They got quite a good. Is it living organ system going on? Um, I don't know, I've, um, I've, um, I only read clips of it, but I'm not, yeah, it's just, I don't know, because in England, United Kingdom, 
when you do a living organ donor, you're doing it because you want to, you've read the information, you've asked the questions, you've done your own, you know, the donors done their own research and you and um, they know the risks and they don't get any money. Of course, yep. Yeah, and in other places, in other countries, they do it, um, or, uh, they, I think they do it in terms of money exchange. But the problem with that is, the, I don't, I'm not sure whether the NHS are keen on doing it like that because they're fighting that the donor wouldn't give all their full medical history. So, for example, if I were if I was getting paid to donate somebody a kidney, I might, and if I started being unwell, I've had all my blood tests, and a month before the you know operation, I started feeling unwell. Da, 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 da. I might not tell the doctors or nurses because I want that money. So not only are you put the, the donor, they're putting themselves at risk because they just want money. So that's yeah, it's very. Yeah, it's not something, I'm not sure how keen that the NHS want to, you know, yeah, because it's all about doing it because you want to. Yeah, yeah. so you touch a number of issues, right, in this topic of the life donation. Mm. Uh, so when we look in donation uh, between family members, uh, that is a decision among family members if yes. someone is willing to donate. And we yeah. often see whether parents, whether kids, want to donate to their parents, vice versa. Exactly. And then all other connections in family can also lead to the donation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if someone a perfect match, that's excellent. Uh, but very often, you know, some of family members cannot donate uh, yeah. for the reasons of, uh, uh, you know, other underlying condition. No oh, yeah, 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 no, yeah, yeah. And sometimes, right, emotionals are not ready. Yeah. And that is something... You know, we cannot ever pressure any organ um, donors yeah, exactly. to make decisions if they're not comfortable with. So yeah. then, uh, because, I, uh, sorry, I wanted to touch on something. Um, I wanted to touch on something because um, I was feeding, I was in America, I was in America and I know you've got Medicare and if you're working, you can insurance, that's what it's based on, unlike in England, where you put, everybody put a money, a pot of money together and um, we've got the NHS. When I was um, reading an article, um, that if you, it was, in fact, I was really scared. Um, one of them is, he said, he donated and he didn't seem to get the care from the doctors and nurses. And um, what was supposed to happen is the person, the recipient was supposed to be paying for the medical bills of the donor, of the, yeah, of the person who's going to do, donate, but it didn't happen. And yeah, and yeah, um, and also the donor wasn't treated very well by the medical establishment. It was, yeah, it was really other stories, yeah, it was really bad. Was it in UK, that experience? Uh, no, 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 it was in America. In America. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, right, so I think it's just, um, you know, going back to like a donor experience, right? Uh, because if you're looking for strangers, or let's say friends who want to donate kidney, that has become that experience there. What can you provide for organ donors to be more comfortable and mm -hmm. making their decision on their own, but also yeah. providing the best care, the best accommodation, because that is incredible gift of life. So it's really interesting that a system itself in process improving things, but things may not happen in fast as it's supposed to happen to really encourage people who want to do life donation to receive all necessary uh, support and care at that time when they donate an organ. Um, yeah. uh, so in the United States, we have a few things that right now improving rapidly and we are very thrilled about it. Um, it's, some of them are still initiative stage, but the biggest part also the mindset, how to provide the system, but also how to provide enough education to give an opportunity for the people who consider an organ donation, yeah, yeah. maybe to do a simple task and just yeah. assess, maybe now, maybe later in your life, you want yeah. to decide to do this. Mm. Um, another thing that I really like to share awareness about organ donation, at least in the United States, and I believe it's similar in UK, any organ donors, if in any time in their life they have kidney failure and they donated kidney previously, 
they get on the top of the list. Oh yeah, that's the same in England, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. that is also very important to share. And mm. it happened very rare because when someone wants to donate their organs, they're gonna get tested, they're gonna be tested for every oh, yeah. single disease yeah. condition. Yeah. They need to be in the best health that possible. And sometimes many people just don't qualify even if they're in a good health whether yeah. their weight, blood pressure. So that's why it's usually people who donate, they're already very healthy and their kidney are healthy. So yeah. that's actually good assurance for this yeah. people thriving to the rest of their life, even living this one kidney. So yeah. what's your thoughts on it? Um, well, funny enough, one of my friends, she put herself forward to donate me to be a living organ to be a living organ donor for me, but she wasn't suitable. And it did make me happy when she said they very they look at the very detailed in what they do. So I felt comfortable that you know they would not you know allow her to go through it unless she was suitable. So yeah I do understand it is very detailed. Um, I think also but one thing I think whether their organ is deceased or alive one thing I've learned from our campaign is that um, people, we're all human beings and we're selfish. So what I've learned is, um, and it's become obvious when I've been doing the campaign, that people were happy to receive it, but they weren't happy to give it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard, right? Um, and I think the big problem, I think, was organ donation is a awareness as we yeah. spoke at the beginning of this conversation there is such a little knowledge about what is kidney disease what is the role of kidney and how greatly people suffer mm. with uh, uh, declining kidneys or kidneys that are uh, in failure so that's why it's really important first of all establish that knowledge for general public whether for purpose of just self-care Mm -hmm. so uh, care of your family and loved ones and detecting early symptoms but also that awareness that if someone's so struggling and you can help and if you're in the point of your life that you want to do that this is the ways to do it um but it, again uh with the campaigns that you're doing uh tell me more uh, what do you yeah. do in the campaign to share that awareness and yeah. between you know more resources uh, yeah. to serve your patients um, this campaign is called The Rebel with a Cause. It's just, um, I'm doing, I'll be doing a radio program. I'm, I'm just training at the moment how to drive the desk and all that and present. And I'll be doing a monthly radio program on Ujima Radio 98 FM and based in Bristol, England, United Kingdom. And it's all about just having, you know, open, this sort of conversation, um, but face to face, really open and honest in, um, discussion about what 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 is lacking why why are people in a certain mindset how do we give people more information how do we is there enough way of raising awareness what are people's concern so it'd be just different topics and you know why why we're in 2019 okay and we're still debating organ donation you would you know or blood donation, bone marrow, you'd have thought would be getting there gradually, especially in England, you'd be getting there gradually. But it's still the same. I remember having this conversation two, five years ago, seven years ago. So from seven, from 2004 to now, little has changed. How can we, because this, I feel this is the most simplest out of all the problems in the world, I think, Blood organ donation and bone marrow is the most simplest one to sort out. And I just don't know why the government in the United Kingdom can't sort it out. I really don't. I really don't understand it. Surely you can't sort the other ones, but I feel this is the most simplest. So it's really looking about what's going on. Why are we still having this um, conversation? So mainly, the guests will be mainly, obviously, Asian, Black, um, African, Caribbean, who've, you know, experienced renal failure, bone marrow transplant, and carers who, um, guest who have, um, one of their son's daughters or relatives has passed away and they want to just share their experience. 
it's all about um, personal storytelling in terms of them telling their listeners their own personal um, their own personal brief experience because I know that becomes quite powerful because people realise oh it's actually going on because I heard somebody on the radio and you know they're not because a lot of it the people the black Asians are um, cowboys they can be quite what's the word I'm wanting to um, suspicious but when you talk but when it's actually visible oh it's going on oh I heard somebody on the radio saying that it must be true so yeah it's just giving that that's what it's really all about really this is this is true we're not making it up. I didn't pay for these guests to come on my radio station to do it on the radio station to tell you this is actually happening. Yeah, so it's all about that, really. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, such a great mission, you know, Thank having you. those true stories and giving them opportunity to share their story of a personal journey, a per story of grief, and that is the best way, right? It's important yeah. to share that awareness, give people a true taste of what does it really feel and what the family go through. We took some time and learned a little bit more about your personal journey, um, rush into dialysis, your transplant story, and the mission um, and the great uh, campaign you're doing in sharing the SRD patient story. Um, one question I always like to ask patients who are long-term ESRD patients, how do you manage your self-care? How did you find the ways to you know, manage your diet, your time management, your energy management, your motivation to you know, go back to kind of normal, finding the time, effort, you know, to really do other things besides just going on dialysis? Mm -hmm. um, I used to work, um, but I was having problems at work in terms of I was doing 30 hours even though I was doing full-time hours, then I cut it down to 30 hours and it was still too much out, yeah, just too much hours. Because what would happen is, I work Monday to Friday, I dialyze Monday evening, Wednesday evening, Friday evening, but I, will, um, I start dialysis about 6.37, and I won't get home until about midnight, and that impacted on my sleep, so I didn't sleep properly. So I had to, I had to take a difficult decision um, not to to resign from doing that work anymore because number one it wasn't what helping me mentally and emotionally and I was just always pissed off all the time because I wasn't getting enough rest <laughs> I do that like, like Monday evening and then before I know it I have to be back on Wednesday in the evening so it wasn't much of a gap I wasn't yeah so I um and so what I decided to do, I decided to start volunteering rather than sitting at the, you know, just going to dialysis, come home and not doing anything. I decided to start volunteering for Ujima Radio and that gave me confidence, experience, a purpose. I don't know if you understand that. It gave me a purpose to live. Um, so yeah. it, was, it wasn't all about, oh, oh, Wednesday, I need to do my dialysis again. I had a... I just thought I had a purpose on this planet. It sounds really weird, but that's the way I thought. I had a purpose on this planet um, to volunteer with Rujima to, you know, put my time in, make it good, make the, you know, radio station good. And from there, that's when the campaign started. Because uh, he was thinking, and because one of my friends suggested, what the lady who was volunteering with Rujima, she said, oh, so why don't you start a campaign? And I said, campaign on what? How about your story, you know, renal failure? I said, hmm. Oh, I, I was like, oh, I don't know if I could tell my per You know, because, but you know, when you tell your story, it's personal, it's private. And he said, but how else are you going to get awareness? You know, the NHS, they do loads of campaign. The numbers, you know, is still quite low. Why don't you, you know, you can start, you know, I help you. So she started... Up, um, she started helping me and then she eased stuff and she left me to get on with it but yeah I just thought because sometimes I feel I'm not religious or anything sometimes I curse God and say why has God given me this disease I don't like it why have you given me I don't like noodles I don't like 
what makes you God think I like needles three times a week? I don't like needles at all. And I don't think anybody else likes it. But then I stop, back down, and then think, of, then say, ah, but I was maybe chosen to have renal failure to do, in, order to do, in order to do this campaign. Because if you don't, if I didn't have renal failure, what campaign would I, what campaign would I be doing? I, I wouldn't know anything about renal failure, would I? So it's just about turning it around. And I thought, oh yeah, I do have a purpose on the planet, on planet Earth. It's not just to go to Dallas and come and drain resources. It's, you know, to, um, you know, to um, raise an awareness, or maybe in a different sort of way. Yeah, I really like how you stated the purpose, right? Finding that purpose that really helped you to be determined. Yes, I'm motivated, yes. Yeah, you, I think, and that's what, whether you got rid of failure or not, or cancer, or whatever, I think when anybody's sick, they need to find a, well, for me, they need to find a purpose. Otherwise, you're just going to whip it, whip it away if you don't think you can be of any use or a purpose on the planet. You think, oh, what am I doing dialysis for? I don't work, so I don't pay my taxes. Then what? So, yeah, it's just finding, it's ultimately finding a purpose. You yeah. need a pur purpose, yeah. At the moment, honestly, if you're doing so much wonderful work, like providing volunteer in the community and sharing the awareness, that really lead to life-saving purpose, right? So that is incredible work yeah. you're doing. So thank yeah. you for, you know, putting your life and your energy into this purpose. This is so meaningful. And I'm sure every Christian out there are so grateful that you felt that power in yourself to raise over from your, you know, you know feeling sick and feeling chronic illness saying, you know, I now have purpose and now this is what I'm going to focus on. That's yeah. what I'm going to fight for. Uh, so thank you for doing it. That's yeah, thank you. But yeah, it's been it's been a lot of hard work. I've enjoyed it because it's something I got. You know, with every you know everybody goes to work to pay the bills, but they don't necessarily have a passion for it. But with me, I've got passion, and sometimes passion always wins. <laughs> before you know, before there, it's good to have money coming in but yeah sometimes passion move because the more passionate people can see and i think the yeah the more, and the more, i think the more likely people probably willing to you know pay for the you know for me to go come and talk or you know give a conference and yeah so yeah it's passion yeah so and you know when we're looking for also hidden disease like kidney disease right mm. we also see that there is such a lack of awareness. So because this disease touched you and got you involved, uh, you know, for your lifetime, fighting this disease, you built so much awareness and knowledge that allows you to actually offer something very unique. Uh, it's a purpose, but it's also a very unique perspective. And having a side of patient perspective, you can be more thoughtful when you advocating and campaigning yes. for social yeah. reforms because yeah. uh, patient-centric care is a key for quality of life, for um, better efficiency of healthcare system, uh, you know, better expenditure plans. It's, it just not only contributes to overall well-being, but also for the financial stake of healthcare. And that is just so important to have someone like you there who can debate on one side of what is really patient need and what's necessary care required. Uh, because there are so many other aspects of uh, organ donations that not only tie to the actual organ given and receiving, but all this emotional, mindful, spiritual aspects that are the key for family members, for uh, patients. Yeah, it's very, yeah, because I think people don't realize how scary it is. Because I told you, I received two calls in the middle of the night. And then, hello, oh, we've got a kidney for you. And then, like, and then they don't realize that you have to make a decision then and then. You listen to what they, and it's, it's the most scariest thing to, you know, to, you know for, for anything like that to happen. It's really weird. It's just like, oh, oh no, I forgot time. I said, do I say yes, do I say no? I'm listening and I'm not feeling this. And 
Yes, really scary. You're in the middle of your night, right? Like that is that is actually very. I've heard a couple of stories about people who were waiting ten years and then they received this call in the middle of whatever happening in their life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they already moved on with life and live on dialysis and expect that as their new life. And then they received this call and you never prepared. And if you even prepared with questions to ask. Sometimes you need to do a hard decisions. What was your last experience when you received? Um, receiving a call was very scary because um, she told me, you know, about the condition of the kidney. And I was like, oh, I don't want that one. Um, I told her, uh, no, it's all right. Thank you. I don't want it. Um, because it, the problem is, it's so difficult because with dialysis, you know, you get the complications and you know the access. People were run out of access. Right. Over so you could die anyway. So it, it's like it's like it's a no win situation. You can you can die eventually on dialysis and you could die if you get the if the kidneys damage anyway. So it's it's very it's very difficult to I think I realised when talking to you that it's a win no win-win situation i think it's up i think the most important thing is the kid um the patient needs to know what they want right so and when you get that call when the person when the nurse or the transplant coordinator or the, whoever is, is telling you about the um condition of the kidney you know and they're saying it's them to say they must say to you oh it's damaged now with me, um, if I had damaged, I know in my mind, I don't want the kidney because I know for my mind what I'm looking for. So, uh, and I, I've realized over, you know, I've been doing dialysis for 14 years, whatever, be, whatever happens, it, it, you know, that's the way it goes. So if I spend so much time waiting for it and I die, then that's the way it goes. If I you know it's it's just the way it goes so i think what i would advise patients is you need to know what type of kidney you want if they're gonna call you and they say um they're gonna they say oh it's damaged you need to ask them how badly damages and also because i know because i'll ask them questions and um the last time i asked them what was the match in terms of the match and the match wasn't very good it was zero match it and plus the um, patient needed to get tested for malaria so no, um, yeah it's not yeah it's not that yeah uh, yeah it's all right i think i'll give that kidney skip right right so that is uh, something to be aware right so um, yeah the patients who you know might be start learning about uh, you know being qualified for kidney and they want to learn about how do you select kidney? What are the criteria? Because just having kidney available sometimes is uh, not the best way for everyone. Exactly. So that's yeah. why how you explain that. Yeah. You have to consult with your doctor and yeah. understand how close the match you want to have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it needs circumstances. To be, yeah. It needs to be a good match, and only you. I think only the patient will know. So if the um, if the nurse co transplant coordinator, the call in England, called uh, called the patient up. They need to be asking, "What is the match? Is the match very good? What is the condition of the kidney? What is the age of the donor?" It's like me. The first one I I had a call. Um, I'm 43, and the uh, patient, the um, the transplant coordinator said the patient didn't have any medical, you know medical problems but the problem but then i asked the age and the per the deceased donor was 60 and i thought oh that's a big gap now that's just me now another patient might be happy to receive that everybody's got different criteria yeah criteria you just need to know yeah um don't um and just be ready that the pet you know just be aware that the kidney might work the kidney might not work Right. And yeah. with this new situation, decision about not taking kidney that from someone 20 years older, 
um, might be some of the reasons because it's your last kidney you can be transplant. Yes. That's yeah. why you are more thoughtful yeah. to get the best match, the best. Exactly. Match. So if it's you, um, it, and also somebody say, uh, and also it depends how desperate you are. If you're one of those, uh, you come to dialysis and you really because you get patients, you know, my age, they're really miserable. They don't really like, you know, they don't like it. I mean, yeah, of course you're not gonna like it. It's not, it's not for, dialysis is not for everybody. Not everybody's going to be happy with dialysis. We, we, and also, so that's one factor. <coughs> Another factor, obviously, what, whether it's your first, second, or, yeah, one. So if it's your last kidney, um, it's not actually, doesn't actually make sense just taking any old kidney. You're better off sticking to the dialysis. So, right. uh, yeah, you, all these things you need to consider. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot to consider, you know, about somebody calling you to o'clock. Oh my God, what are the questions do I need to ask again? Because <laughs> you get a mind block. Because I get a mind block. Oh, what are the questions do I need to ask? Age, you know, I'm going through my mind. Because you have to say yes or no in that conversation, isn't it? You say, oh, oh have I asked about age? Have I, what's the condition of the kidney? And you're listening carefully to do what the nurse is saying. Yeah, so how do you come up with that criteria? Did you talk to your doctor and you identify what would be the best one, or did you come up with that eventually from all your experience? No, it's, it's based on it's based on experience because you talk to other patients and they give you information you don't know. It's oh, yeah, or oh, better note that down, and that's what it's been based on. So, um, all through the years, I've gathered a lot of knowledge because. Um, I've spoken to other patients, other patients have spoken to me, I've given some tips to other um, patients, um, some of the um, nurses have said, if you, um, said a few things to me, so it's all been, you know, I didn't know, I, I only knew all these criteria when I became an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. It's oh, yeah, makes sense. quite complicated. Yeah, and, so yeah. Like... and yeah, all food, all for my life, I was learning. Uh, so, Adamo, with this conversation today, uh, how would you advise someone who might be looking for applying to receive a kidney, right? And in the process, uh, how would you suggest for them to go about it when they receive that call what questions should they ask or what questions they need to think prior about that it. call to make some of the decisions and having their mind to piece of paper next to their phone um then it, it depends whether it's the first or last kidney first second last kidney so that'll be another thing because remember if it's your last kidney as i say don't be choosing any kidney okay yeah be sure yeah um another one age so per um what the transplant coordinators try to do as you know they try to match as close age as possible with me 20 years was too big for me now um i would say um i would say from i would say from somebody um 20 years if it was 10 years that would be fine for me but remember that it's just me it's no point you need to remember and also again when i'm speaking to my consultant they say i don't know if you know this that um when you get to 40 from 40 onwards each year the kidney works one percent less each year for a healthy person, right? You're yeah. Just for yeah. healthy person. So, for a, so, yeah, for a healthy person who's got two kidneys, nothing wrong with them, that 40, as soon as they reach 40, their kidney function is going to be 1% less each year. So, if you're thinking of a 60 year old, that's 20 years. So, that's 20, that's, that'd be 20% less function. So, that's what ends. I gathered that information ends. That was my why I said when the um, when I had when I was called for the first donor with I said it was too big. Age gap is not them. Also, you need to be aware of the matching process. 
Um, obviously, they do blood. Um, if you're A positive, you go to A positive and tissue typing and DNA. They'll do all that tissue typing. I think they got it. There's something I've read somewhere. I was just looking. Again, when I, I picked up a leaflet, the doctors didn't tell me this. I had to seek the information myself. And even the patients don't know what is happening because I had to find out about this matching process myself. In terms of, you see, they do, six out of six is really good, and then one out of six is not very good. And you can get a match zero out of six or something. That's not very, that's bad, really bad. But again, I was reading a leaflet to find that out. None, none of the doctors or nurses told me about that. And um, don't be afraid to ask questions. So, you know, length of, um, well, yeah, you need to ask whether the patient has got any med serious medical condition. Now, um, I know they don't tend to use cancer patients, but if the, if the, um, if the nurse is saying, oh, um, they didn't die of cancer, um, you try to get as much information of what they die of. Now, if they say, um, they used to have cancer and now they recall, but they died of something else, so then that's ringing, that's really giving you warning bells, really, because, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, take a cancer patient. Anyway, and just, yeah, just be... Just a little clarification about this. That seems like um, patients have to have a lot of knowledge, what Kashi yes. talks about open diseases. Uh, so cancer um, patients, if they die from cancer, is dangerous because then yes. the cancerous uh, cells would be yeah. spread. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Then other infectious diseases, what you were mentioning, malaria. Uh, or yeah, malaria, um, malaria, hepatitis B or something is on all those everything. I know for HIV, they don't offer, so they won't offer me a HIV, I'm not HIV, because they give HIV to HIV patients, mm -hmm. which makes sense. So right. yeah, yeah. So yeah, just to be, yeah, just to be, um, um, just to be, um, Clear. Uh, just one question on that. So we know that the process for the living donors is so rigorous to get the healthiest kidney, yeah, the yeah. healthiest patient. But when a deceased donor, uh, the quality of kidney uh, way lower or could be fine, but but could be lower. And that there is a practice that patients may have previous the deceased donors may have a cancer, but it's still kidney would be for donation, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, because I've heard the story in, in England. I don't know what it is. She had a, um, I don't know, did she? No, she said she wasn't told that the deceased person had cancer. So she took the kidney mm -hmm. and she had cancer herself. And yeah. she was thinking of suing because she said, never told me. Because if, I wouldn't have taken it because she said, why would I take a deceased organ which has got a kidney, which has got cancer, which is cancerous? That doesn't even make sense to me. So, yeah, you need to, yeah, you just, um, yeah. It, but, uh, but the problem with the, is what I find in, in, I don't know whether it's in the same as in your essay, that you have to find the information out yourself. Because all my criteria for, you know, for getting my own kidney, I didn't know until like, I'm 43 now. So I didn't know until, about, how long has it been taking me to gain all this knowledge? It's taken me about, since I was now about, oh, 30 odd years, just to gain all this information. No, none of, I just thought that none of the medical doctors or nurses tell you things. It's not like, oh, this is the way the transplant works, okay? They give you a leaflet and you read it. Oh, I know about matches because I have to be do, do, do. It's not like that. You have to find it out yourself. How frustrating. But thank you so much for sharing your experience because I, I think that is a highlight of, you know, today's conversation in terms of uh, patient's education, right? That is important phase. Yeah. Kidney, receiving this call and being prepared for this call. Mm know in advance which questions you have uh, have to yeah. ask and which answers will be you uh, yeah. will be matched for your yeah. decision taking kidney or not so at the moment thank you so much for sharing your knowledge because thank you that is fantastic for someone who may have 
less information, less experiences you do with the SRD to have that access. And we'll again share your information so people can reach out to you directly and then you can advise them with your own experience you. having own individual conversation. Um, so we are wrapping up today's call, but it was such a pleasure to connect with you. And you. And it was so nice to learn about your story, to see how dedicated, how passionate you are, and also see how much knowledge you have. So I'm so excited for your upcoming campaign because yeah, thank you. it's going to be very successful. Oh, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about this. Uh, just, you know, in wrapping up this conversation, do you have any uh, last comments and recommendations for ESRD patients in their journey? Yeah, um, I got um, this um, website which, which I've joined is um, Renal Support Patient Group. It's on Facebook. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and what I like about that is got it's not only got it's got all, you got patients with different experiences. So if um, people if people are listening and they want to get oh different 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 experiences, oh I got that. I'm not sure what somebody else has done. That's a good one to go to Facebook. Yeah, so that's a good one. You got people from America all over the world, and everybody's got different experiences, and you are able to see oh. Would I able to do it their way or do I need to do it? Yeah, so that's quite good. Um, also, um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. So people can fo um, follow me on there. And the Instagram is um, the underscore R underscore W underscore A underscore C. Or just type in my full name and double me a light and you'll... Yeah, you'll see my logo. Yeah, you'll provide that's it to us, so you'll add to this yeah. video. And yeah, so um, that's enough one. And on the Facebook and Instagram, I'm sharing my day-to-day -day story of how it is to be a dialysis patient. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Liverpool, that real failure, yeah. To follow so, you. Some, and just of them, to <clears throat> some of them, you know, one or two of the posts are is a bit funny because, you know, I'm... Um, like that, yeah, I like to entertain and like that. And also, lastly, um, positivity breeds positivity. So if you're po um, whatever this is, if you're positive, you draw posit more positive people. Because where I volunteer, there's a guy who always says to me, I inspire him. He says yeah. that, yeah. So, I see that. yeah, so that's what you. No matter how bad it, it does get really, really bad. It does get bad. You know, I'm not going to lie. But if you can find it deep within you just to show, you know, have a laugh. I like having a laugh. I like joking around. I just, I like doing all those sort of things. It just like, yeah. And I find that it's up to me in terms of, because having a laugh and all that, it releases the, maybe the depression and all that. And it all comes through in the laughter and you know, joking way. So yeah, so that's another thing. Yeah, so keep up joy, positivity in your life because yeah. that is the key for mm. happiness and yeah. you know, every day having that necessary energy, fighting your disease, but also mm -hmm. you know, focusing on your mission. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. <laughs>um, enough of got enough a few other ones are um, cold off the streets, um, so to so, and city rockers. They all got shows on Ujima Radio, so if you want to, you'll find them. I also got Up Our Street, their magazine based in Bristol, and they, they do different. Um, they're very well connected with the Somalian community. Um, also, give a kidney once enough. That's a like independent group in England, 
and it's all based on people who have actually donated one kidney living yeah so if you're thinking of being a living organ donor and you want independent advice they don't want to go what they based in england um england it's good to have a um a different range of of people of organizations um, you can talk to and then lastly i've got an organization called CAS. they deal with um the, um, people with mental illness especially within the afro-caribbean you know um, um communities and i want to thank them very much for their support so uh, yeah much appreciated um sorry if i've missed one of them I, i've got so many of them so sorry if i've missed any of them out but yeah i'd like to thank them very much yeah thank you so much uh, thank you so much to you and to your team doing such a fantastic job for esrd community thank you very much <laughs>